Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest, former WWF superstar, former ECW World Tag Team Champion, Mr. AJ Petruzzi. Welcome to Two Man Power Trip. How are you doing? Very well. And you? Very good. What, what's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Well, like a semi-retirement at this stage of our lives, we're still a little bit dabbling here and there and with this crazy sport of pro wrestling a little bit laid back anymore no more of the craziness traveling around the world and the country and everywhere else but still got our fingers and dabbles do you still pay attention to like as far as current wrestling stuff or not really much anymore mm, not really since it got more commercial and tna and not really as much as we used to back in the day because if you're not really involved in working, it's just not the same by watching it. Because it's not, I mean, years ago, you you were taught to tell a story. Hmm. Or if uh, the agent, let's use an example, Chief J. Strongbow would come on and say, hey, Petrucci, he got 20 minutes. That guy up in the top, bleachers there, in about 15 minutes, if you don't have them down on ringside trying to kill you and selling the story, there's no sense coming back. Well, today they want to do 50 million high spots. And how do you how do you explain a story when, when it's they tried everything and did it all? It doesn't make sense. There's no storytelling anymore. Definitely a lost art for sure. Lack of psychology, right, too. That's that's wow. Yeah, that's. I don't know if they have it anymore. I don't know who writes anymore. I don't know who's the big shots anymore. I do see a little bit of update that uh, people are getting in trouble with all the crap that they pulled over the years. But, uh, the, you know, that's that's up to the lawyers and the fighting and the money and whatever. Uh, my stage of the game was back in the early to mid 80s. Let's say I think I started 1983. So it was kind of sort of a lot different than it is today. And uh, we, our training was a lot different when we went to the WWF school up in Orange, Connecticut. I think, yeah, it was Orange, Connecticut at Kenny, Kenny Passarello's Quest. And at that time, we trained. I mean, I'm sure you uh, did some spots with Mario Mancini, who was with us from the beginning. Yes, yes. And uh, we, he had his, thank God he lived there, but we were together in a, uh, I think it was like an apartment complex with myself, Dave Barbie, a power lifter out of Philadelphia, uh, Seth Cohen, who was also a trainer there. And we would be up like five in the morning and doing some leg work out in the road. We'd come back, eat breakfast and go to the gym. We'd work out to almost noon, go for lunch. Then we'd come back in the ring till five at night. And this was every day. So when we trained, we trained. Today, I don't know how they trained. I read a little bit here over the years about the backyard wrestlers and stuff like that. Come on. You know, you, you got to be joking. And who would even pay to do that, to be trained? You know, we were trained to really hurt people if we had to. And we were also trained to do other things that if we had to. But that's not what we were there for. So I don't know, you know, you, you tell me if you've been around the block, you tell me. Yeah, it's definitely different nowadays. And I feel like all those high spots and no psychology and a lot of the lack of selling, I just feel like the crowd, sometimes you could lose them like within an instant because they've seen that move a million times. And you know what I mean? Like you have other guys back in the day, like old school guys, Savage would just point to the crowd would go crazy or Hogan would just do that finger. You know, the crowd would go crazy. Nowadays they do something where they almost legitimately break the guy's neck. Sometimes don't even get a pop. And why is that? I think been there, done it, seen it a million times, and just waiting for the next guy to do it. And the other generation, I believe, is looking for somebody to get hurt. They're looking for that devastation. They're looking for broken bones. They're looking for something drastic to happen that they could say, wow, you know, this is real. <laughs> Come on. It is real. Absolutely. It's funny, though, the art of it is completely lost. You're supposed to not really hurt the guy. And now they're they're really hurting the guy, but they're not getting any reaction for it. 
Yeah, well, that's again, ideology, maybe their upbringing, maybe what they're, you know, everybody back in the day with the cafe and everybody, they, they didn't, they thought it was real. They had no idea what was really going on behind lines. I mean, uh, at this point in our lives, when my father, God rest his soul, Italian, I mean, and my grandparents, Italians, they were Bruno San Martino all the time. And they would always say, it's all real. What they didn't understand was it was real up to the finish. I mean, many a times our agents would say, you got 20 minutes, how you get there, the finish, here's the finish, how you get there, it's up to you guys. Well, this is great. I mean, people don't get it today. Today, everything's scripted to, to, to every everything. Even, I'm even going to say a year ago, we were still in the ring, my partner and I from ECW, and we'd go into the dressing room and uh, these new, the new talent I was going to say, I'm going to say down the road, and, and we'd sit there with them and say, listen, how many years have you been working? And, uh, you know, one guy would say, oh, eight years. How many matches have you had in eight years? Well, you know, I just, uh, well, here's the way it's going to happen. Because you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to hurt them. And this is the right. way it is. Now, today, you'll sometimes you'll see some of these guys that will just say, well, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to do. And this, wait a minute. Is that right? Well, when we get out there, things happen really quick. So whatever they were going to do didn't happen. And then they, you wonder why, and then they'll come back and say something. Yo, respect is a hell of a lot of things. Years ago, when we would walk in the, walk in the locker, room, locker room, especially with Vince's locker room, new guys like myself, Dave, Barbie, Seth, Mancini, you sat in the corner, you didn't say nothing. You didn't say nothing. And guys like The Undertaker and so, some of the other big shots would come in and put their earphones on and sit down in the corner. And it, it was unbelievable. You could hear a pin drop a lot of dressing rooms. Now, some you didn't. Some of them were a little bit high strung, but that's okay. But yet it was held in regard. I mean, over the years with the independence, you go in the dressing room and it's, you can't hear yourself think. Everybody's yelling at each other. What's going on? This match, that match. I don't know. Maybe the professionalism, maybe I'm old school like Mario and Dave Barbie. If you ever, ever heard of Dave Barbie, Jesus, mm -hmm. he used to come out and just warm up with 500 on the bench. The guy was an animal. And uh, you get respect. Now, as far as you were mentioning WWF and that, that training in, in Orange, Connecticut, how did that even come about? Like, how did you kind of get recruited in? And who ran that camp? <clears throat> well, you know, <sighs> recruitment, Recruitment was a, a – how can I explain this to you? In my, in my case, I worked at Bethlehem Steel, and we got laid off back in the 80s. And I, I was uh, laid off for a period of time, and I started to get pretty heavy and was drinking a lot and became a, like uh, a functioning alcoholic. And uh, – my father was a steel worker too for many years and he come over here one day and he said, listen, if you're waiting for the steel to call you back, don't even wait, do something because you might not ever get back. And we were collecting. So I started to get in shape. I started running again. I quit drinking altogether. And I, this is, this is awesome because Penn state university wanted to do a book on this. I was running up, Jim Thorpe's Monument in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. I was running up there, and I used to run up that way to the top of the mountain. And this, uh, I think this was like a Ford or a Lincoln Continental pulls up alongside of me. And I look inside, and in the back seat is a, a friend that I've known forever, Tom Chapman. At the time, I had no idea, but he was a WWF referee. In the front seat, was Captain Lou Albano and Tommy wow. Altamore. And uh, Tom says, as I'm, they stopped me, and I thought they were looking for directions. And Tom says to me, hey, uh, this is so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and, -so, and uh, these guys would like you to come to a show. And I'm thinking, yeah, right, this is bullshit. And I kept running again. 
And this is no, this is a real deal. So they stopped again a little bit. And Tom says, no, I'm serious. Uh, I'm going to Madison Square Garden in a week. I'll pick you up. I'm taking my son and we're going up there and see a show. And all right, I agree to it. The week goes by and he picks us up and we go to the Madison Square Garden and Carta Blanc, since he knew referee, knew everybody, set us right up in the front row. And that was the night that uh, Sergeant Slaughter, Snooker, Snooker dove off the steel cage on the top on the Sarge. And afterwards, he took us to the Radisson or whoever, where everybody was there and we got to meet everybody. And I'm thinking, gee, you know, this is, I don't know. And I'm laid off from the Bethlehem Steel. I'm thinking this is really weird. A couple of days later, they called me again. Tom did, and he said uh, they're going to do TV taping in Allentown, Pennsylvania, at Agricultural Hall. Would you come down there? They want to talk to you and meet you and some other guys. Well, okay, we go down there. We get down there, and uh, I meet Dave Barbie. Seth. I don't know if Mario was there or not. But they take us in the back in the dressing room and we meet the bigger stars of the world and they throw me a security shirt and they throw Dave Barbie a security. So we're a security around the ring that night. And that's the night that the Samoans were the tag team champs and they lose to Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson. So after the show, they invite us back inside and then Tony Altamore comes up and said, listen, we're starting a school in Orange, Connecticut, and we would like you guys to come up there. I'm thinking, gee, you know, I got two kids living in Jim Thorpe. They said it would cost three grand the train, and then you'd have to join Passarello's Quest, which was the gym that they had their new wrestling ring in. And uh, that's how it started. And I thought, I don't know how if I could do this or not. So Tom, the referee, says, I'll drive up take you up there and we'll take a look at the place and go and check it out, which he did. And we got up there and we slept in the goddamn car. We left the night before and we got up and looked. Kenny Passarello, he was uh, into bodybuilding at the time, if that name sounds familiar, because Mario went there too. And uh, we got in there and checked. The place was brand new. The ring was there. All the weights were in there. He had all the, all the top-notch stuff because I think he was Mr. Universe or something at the time in his division. Kenny Passarello. So Tony Altamore comes in and we're sitting down there and talked everything over. I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to do this? Because again, I have a family in that. I'm collecting unemployment from the steel company. But I had a 66 Corvette convertible at the time. So I came home, talked to the wife. I sold the Corvette to pay to go to the school and to stay I think I stayed in a hotel a couple of times, but then Seth Cohen, his father, got this apartment building, and we were set up with Dave Barbie that if we would buy the supplies or whatever, we could stay there rent-free. And that's how it worked out. And I believe uh, guests would come in like Sal Belomo, Hogan. I think there was pictures on the walls. I do post now and then some of the signatures that would come in there as guests. And uh, that's when the training started. And uh, that's basically, and with my wrestling high school background, in three months, I kept looking at Altimore's book since he was an agent. And uh, he would say, always watch the book. When you go home on the weekends, we would be there like four days. And I'd leave on, a, I think, a Thursday night or and come home for Friday, Saturday, and leave again Sunday afternoon. And a lot of the shows would be in Pennsylvania here which was really good. And then the one day Tom Chapman, the referee calls me and said, Hey, there's a show in Peaburg, New Jersey, close by on a Saturday. I'll pick you up and go there. Now, all I had at the time was a pair of boots. So we get to the show. Chief J Strongbow was the agent and he's Tom's friend. So I get in the bleacher sitting with Tom. He says, now I'll be the ref. So I'll go down there. He comes back and he said, chief wants you downstairs. I said, why? He goes, he wants you downstairs. So I go downstairs and Chief goes, you have your stuff. I said, all I got is a pair of boots. Your first match. He says, you know the stuff? Can you do? Can you wrestle? I said, with three months? Well, yeah, we're ready to go. So I go downstairs with my boots. Tony Atlas comes over with a pair of trunks, says, get, you know, here's your trunks, put them on. 
Chief gets B. Brian Blair brings him over to me and says, you guys, 20 minutes. So Brian talks to me. He goes, what can you do? I said, everything. Tony Altamore trained us. So we go out for 20 minutes, had one of, the, one of the great matches, the first time ever. I thought, oh, boy, I finally get paid, right? This match is over. The whole show's over. I'm going home. I said to Tom, I never got paid. He said, that's your induction. <laughs> so it <laughs> was the start. Nice. And it was uh, – it was. thank God that Tony, our trainer, actually was the agent. Cause that opened doors. I mean, we would, we were still training and then we'd go to Poughkeepsie, New York for TV taping. And then Tony would be the agent up in the North, uh, Northeast up like Maine and Massachusetts and all those places. And we'd, he'd be saying, look at, you're going to be here this weekend. We got shows here and there. And that's when Mario would come myself, Dave Barbie, Seth Cohen, and we'd be filtered in. And then guys would come in to start learning like uh, Paul Roma Oh, if I forget all the guys that came in there, Ted Arcidi, one of the strongest bench pressers of the world back then. Vince always wanted the, the big shots. So that's how it started. And it lasted, uh, wow, a lifetime. That's awesome, the way, the way you kind of get in. And, and they, they give you, you know, right to the wolves, if you will. Like three months and boom, you're, you're uh, you know, you're working on a, on a big time WWF show. It was it was great because they gave you you know I'm nobody from nowhere and would I have gotten in without Tom Chapman I doubt it I kind of doubt it I mean it just kind of sort of I really wasn't even interested my grandparents were the wrestling fanatics I mean I did great in high school I did a lot of good things and I was a great athlete in school but Actually, just last year up here in Carbon County, I was just inducted in the Carbon County Sports Hall of Fame. Nice, I congrats. Thought, yeah, I thought, well, thank you. And I don't like those acclamations. You know, a lot of the a lot of the stuff, even with the ECW, all the stuff we won and the other independents that we, we won, it, it's it's something that we earned. And a lot of things I don't agree with some of the people that are in there that that didn't really earn it you know they were kind of sort of as an example maybe uh, girls basketball that didn't do a thousand points and they got in it somehow maybe they're running out of people i don't know but you know, there's a lot of things that are what we were called back in the day to jobbers sure we did what we had to do but there's a lot of things that people don't know don't know what we did you can ask mario if you do him again about fracture fransberg did he tell you that story? No, nope. Well, back in my early career, since I was being a lot on TV and we were getting some premier matches and a couple of them that they would let me get over and win, they wouldn't publicize. Like Jim Powers at the Philadelphia Spectrum. When I beat him, that was my onslaught to go overseas to Saudi Arabia or New Zealand when we did the tours. Well, at one time, I got called up in the office in Greenwich. And I don't know if you heard the name Mark Sadacek. No, not very familiar, no. He was a nephew of George the Animal Steel. Oh, okay. And he worked in the office. He had his own office up there in the, in the corporate building. And uh, he called me up in the office and he said, uh, can I talk to you? I said, you know, he introduced himself, who he was, and his uncle. And I said, sure. So he takes a towel, puts it under the door, disconnects the phone, closes the shades on the window. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? Uh, I just, I'm not out of the school that long. And I went from almost 300 pounds on to 240, put together pretty good. Yep. He said, uh, there's a radio station out of New York, B105 four or six or seven and uh they're offering to do all this free publicity and airtime for vince if they run this program they're looking for a before i get into what they're looking for he said they have a a program going on that a mafia kingpin has died and he left the will and in the will he owns apartment buildings, casinos, boats, all this stuff 
And at the bottom of the, of the will is a professional wrestler named Fracture Franzberg. Nice. And, they, and, they, and Mark says to me, we would like you to portray this character. I said, what? He said, Vince wants you to do this. We know that you're a big Italian guy because they changed my name with the CCI to ZZI to bring in the Italian because Bruno San Martino loves the Italian at that time. And he, he wanted the Italian base. Well, now all of a sudden, I don't have the picture here in this room. They wanted me to wear a mask, a cape, a singlet, turquoise with white stripes, the boots white with FF fracture Franzberg. And the mask had stars on it. In a, in a like a glove with all kind of stuff on it. And I thought, gee, this is like a comic character. And the people that come up with this idea, they are going to dress the guy in the front as a mafia kingpin with the striped suit, the stogie, the hat, and the radio announcers are going to come follow him from behind. I thought, man, I don't know. This, this doesn't sound right. Mark says, this is your chance because this is, you're going to be put over. You're going to win everybody. So I thought, you know what? Okay. You know, I'm young yet. Actually, I was 29 when I got in. I'm actually old in today's standards. They want to, you know, yourself, they want you young. Yep. So I thought, okay, let's go. So the first one was upstate New York somewhere. I forget Albany, Troy, Utica, whatever. And the first, uh, First guy I get is uh, S.D. Jones. We get up there, and Rene Goulet, and I forget who the other agent was, at the uh, Grilla Monsoon. I get up there, and there's a, a dressing room with my name on it. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? You know, this ain't going to go good with the other guys because I'm nobody. I get in the dressing room, and I'm getting all dressed up, and I put this glove on, and Rene comes in, and he's furious screaming and yelling that's my gimmick nobody wears this damn it's a claw in other words so we're, we're talking and i'm thinking i'm fired already you know i'm done <laughs> i didn't even get a chance and i'm done gorilla monsoon comes in and said what's going on here and trying to explain everything and he said listen this is for the radio this has nothing to do with nothing this is for the radio people we're getting all this freak publicity this that and everything else well he can't use that thing that is mine he calls Vince on the phone up in Connecticut. Vince gets on the phone and says, he's doing it, and that's the way it's going to be. And we went in, and we did the thing, and we did it, and it was okay. Next show is the same damn thing. I think it was with Jim Powers in another New York, because that's where they were from, up in New York State. What's for a radio station? That's and they got listeners, because this was something different. And I, you know, I, was, I looked pretty damn good, and I come out with the cape sequence, the whole works. Then all of a sudden, they sent me to Pittsburgh, PA, San Martino's backyard. Jesse Jackson, I think, was the guy, or Jimmy Jackson was the guy I had to work with. And San Martino is losing it. A freaking Italian wearing a mask, wearing a glove. What the hell do you think? This is a comic book strip character? And he was furious. And there was poor Gino Morella, Grilla. He's telling, this is what Vince wants. This is the guy that was picked to do this. We did it. Everything went good again. Everything went nuts. Next thing I know, I get picked to go overseas for a tour. So they give the gimmick to Mario Mancini. <laughs> well, his size wasn't my size. And lo and behold, while I was out there, they killed the gimmick. So by the time I got back, it was over. It's all Mario's fault. Damn it. Well, you can blame him if you know him. <laughs> he knows. He knows all about it. It was. We joke about it now and then, and that happened the same thing too. When I uh, when I wasn't working, I was a corrections officer here in Pennsylvania, a, a CO. So lo and behold, we had some of the film crew from up there in Connecticut come down here when I was working with the PR twenty four and in my outfit and had pictures taken. And to this day, I still have the sealed letter in my uh, 
the strong box that I sent up and sat with George Scott, who was the big shot at Vince back in the day. And I thought, well, I'm real. I am a CEO. I do this when I'm not on with them guys before I was full time. Lo and behold, they send me overseas again. When I come back, I'm wondering who the hell's this guy with the gimmick, the big boss man. Here they gave it to Bubba Rogers from down WCW. Yep. I thought, son of a bitch, maybe I should uh, at that time gotten an attorney at that time. But again, you know, we're we were young, had no idea what the concept was back in then those days, but. I have the pictures to this day, the first idea with all the pictures from the big boss man. Isn't that amazing? That is crazy. I guess you shouldn't go overseas. Anytime <laughs> you do, they steal your gimmick. Well, they paid well, even when we yeah. did the commercials. You know, we did, I did one of the first commercials with the uh, JBL dolls, myself, Dave Barbie, and uh, with all the big shots, you know, like Hogan and uh Hillbilly Jim, like the commercials that we did myself and Hogan training Hillbilly Jim. Yeah. Yep. Of those. yep. Yep. Yeah, that was another good thing. But then right away, uh, even with the L the JBL doll, I think they were LJN. LJN dolls. We did those, and then all of a sudden half the guys got fired after that, all those big shots. But it was a good learning experience and uh when I became a counselor for troubled runaway and homeless youth, that's on my Wikipedia page too. I used to always say, follow your dreams because you never know what's around that door. You never know. So other, uh, I don't know what other kind of questions that you would have that's pertinent, but I'm sure you have some. Oh yeah. So what was Hulk Hogan like? Obviously, you know, you're, you're there supposedly trying to help Billy, but what was uh, the Hulkster like? He was he was amazing. I'm telling you right now, he was when we did those commercials with that, which was an, almost an all day event. He was professional. Even in the commercials, when he would say AJ, come here, he was really really down to earth. I don't care what anybody says about him to this day. He was he was kind. I you know I. I I just wish I would have had more work with him. I really do. Because he seemed like, uh, and brother, don't think I wasn't itching. Every time we did a tape up there, I was hoping. Even when they, with the chief picked me to do with Roddy Piper. And I'm thinking, well, he came back and I had a job to do. And <laughs> we did it. We got paid. But, uh, yeah, no, Hogan was all right. He was a good guy. I, and to me, he was a good guy. Now, I don't know about it, what anybody else says. I can't did, say anything bad. Did you get to work him at all or no? No, I never did. I really didn't. We trained a couple of times up there at uh, Passarello's in the gym. He would do some holes with stuff. Well, you can see that on the training with Hillbilly. Yep. He, but he was professional. He didn't pull no punches. He didn't want, you know, to hurt. Well, you wouldn't hurt anybody anyway. You try not to. Things do happen, but sometimes you get a potato, sometimes you don't. But then you're always to give it back if people know out there what potato is. Absolutely, yeah. You're, you you're potatoing the guy. Yeah, absolutely. You're stiffing that. him, if you will. Yeah, yeah. like like yeah. David Schultz. He was good at that. Oh, did you like Because I know you worked him. Did you not like working him because of that style? Well, after he beat up Mario, I kind of had a – I had a set thing straight. <laughs> but – uh he was okay after a while. I got to say that. How'd you Tony, set him straight? We were at a, when, when he broke Mario's nose and busted his face up pretty good, we met upstate New York at a show. I don't know if the Samoans ran it or whatever, and we had some words in the dressing room because uh, he heard that I wasn't too happy what he did to Lenny. And he was back in the dressing room. We just had a few words. He said, you're not, you know, you're not really pissed off or anything like that or anything that happened. Uh, I said, we'll see. That's as far as we'll go. No fight or anything? I won't say anymore. Oh, okay. All right. But you were okay with him after that? We, we settled our dispute. Let's put it that way. Okay. All right. Be, I mean, he seemed to be okay. I mean, Tony Altamore trained us the right way. And uh, there was one incident 
I can, I can, there's a tape out there when we were down in the Philadelphia Spectrum. I ended up with Schultz before all of this even happened. And we were still green. And we were training hard. And Dave Barvey, one of the strongest men I've known, when we trained together, we trained hard. So when we and Schultz went in, we knew what the finish was. And whatever moves that were going on, I countered with everything. And he was getting mad. And I mean, he was getting mad. And out there is the tape. <clears throat> and after a while, he was so mad, he made a fist. And he hit me right between the eyes. And I saw stars. And I didn't go down. I just backed up a few steps. And he's, whoa, whoa, what's, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, the referee said, go home. Did the finish, went home, went back to the dressing room. All hell broke loose. And I mean hell broke loose. I'm not going to go into detail, but some of the big boys are back there. Who the hell is this nobody from nowhere making us look bad here? We're this and that. And Altimore is over here in the corner laughing his ass off. And uh, Hogan's there and, and all the big shots are there. <laughs> and Altimore is there. When I train the guys, they're going to take on anybody. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I'm thinking, here we are. I'm fired again. Yeah. Fired again. But we kind of sort of uh, made like a statement that Tony Altimore's guys are, are okay. You know, they were trained the right way. And obviously you didn't get any heat for it or you didn't get in any trouble for it because you no, kept, kept on keeping on. Sort of, uh, we kind of sort of – Got a little bit more work, actually, because it was hard to get a full-timer in there. I'm not distracting you. I'm, I'm setting my uh, insulin pump. I'm oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. I just, I just got to set this quick. But keep shooting. Keep shooting. What about Vince McMahon? Did you have any sort of relationship? I know, obviously, Tony's the agent. You're kind of going through Tony most of the time. But any sort of relationship at all with Vince? Not really, all my all my signed contracts were Linda McMahon. Wow! So you dealt with her more. Yeah, it was all through interdepartmental, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, what did you think of him? Because obviously, I mean, you probably ran into him a time well, or two. He didn't have a whole lot to say to the lower class, if you know what I mean. But the guys lower on the card. Yeah. Now there was a couple of things that. When I first got in, his father was in charge. His father was a, was kind of more apt to the guys because he he didn't have all the territory that Vince Jr. took over everything. And I still remember some stories when I traveled in the early days with uh, Jose Luis Rivera, uh, Soto, all the lower card guys. <coughs> Uh, Luis said uh, a couple of times, once time he went to the office in Connecticut and said, listen, I'm only maybe two shots a week and I might have to go back to Puerto Rico. Can you help me out or something? And the father would pick up the phone and say to the booker, put Luis on for two more shows a week. And that's, that's taking care of your people. Yep. But Vince, you know, the only thing that I really had – when uh, the last top trip we made overseas, I'm not sure where we were, either Australia, New Zealand, or, or uh, Saudi Arabia, when I come back, our slot was filled. And Dave Barbie, they sent him up to Canada at Calgary for Stu Hartz. And Dave was teaming up there. He was with Bill Kazmaier and all the big shots at that time that were in Canada training to come back to be big. In, the, in uh, the U.S., Dave Barbie was supposed to team up with Hercules Hernandez, and Hernandez got hurt. So they bring Dave back to Hershey Park, and I ended up coming back after we were down in WC, no, Crockett, with myself and Ron Shaw and Larry Winters went down to, to Crockett. And the only thing I had with Vince is I showed up at Hershey to see Dave, and they take a mask off of Dave and they go in and he, he gets squashed. So all that training up top. And I said, Vince says, Oh, what are you doing here? I said, I come to see Dave and this and that. And he, I said, I'm ready to come back. That's the only thing. And did we come back? No, we didn't come back. 
So then things opened up a little bit different in uh, 1991 with ECW. Yeah, how, how does that come about when you head over to uh, ECW? I guess it's Todd Gordon. Was it Todd Gordon at that point, or was it Joel Goodhart at that point? <laughs> well, in the first, it was Tri-City, Tri Tri-State. The Tri-State League. Wrestling, yeah. yeah. And at that time, we were bouncing around. I can't recall because we Goodhart had Tri-State. Uh, Ron Shaw, who was with Vince in the early days in 81 and so, and the executioner, and Ron yep. and I did an executioner together with Mike Dano, NWF, and some of the other ind independents. And Ron and Larry Winters, uh, he, they were doing something together with them, and they brought us in a couple of times to do some regular shows as myself, AJ Petrucci. And then uh, Goodhart got, his, got out of it. Todd Gordon took over the reins. And I was working up here with Colonial Wrestling League out of Pomerden with the Special Olympics and Hogar Cray Drug and Rehab Centers doing stuff for charity and putting shows on with them getting the money. And uh, they invited us down there with uh, George Miller, who was the owner of the Buick uh, franchise, and he ran the, the, the school. And we went down there and checked it out, and it was just on its legs. It was just starting out. And uh, Ron Shaw and I went down there, and we were going to do – we did the executioner gimmick, and then Ron disappears. I didn't know it at the time, but then he said he went with another group, and he started traveling. I guess Kowalski had somebody that he knew, and he was started traveling. Well, then we hooked up with uh, another friend, Doug Stahl, that ended up we we brought in our uh, Hunter Q. Robbins the third its manager come out of nowhere and next thing we become the super destroyers and uh, again we didn't know what the hell we were doing this new organization and next thing you know we become the third biggest entity in the world and it, it took off and we were doing Mike Schmidt's sports bar Tabor Rams in Philadelphia and uh, we became the longest reigning champs in history. That nobody could take it away, thank God. And uh, history was made. What do you, you think know? of that Super Destroyer gimmick? Well, you know, it's been around for a long time. I mean, when you yeah. look in the books, I mean, uh, down, was it uh, Crockett Productions or somewhere down south? There was, a, uh, I forget their names. They were, oh, my God, I can't remember. There was down there. Then there was an, another group I just saw on, I forget who the hell was it. Man, I can't remember. My mind's going crazy. But there was a few there, but we were the only ECW Super Destroyers. So there there were different destroyers in different leagues. But there were so many masked guys, too. I mean, there over the years, there was a ton of them. There was a lot of fake ones, too, that were going like us. I mean, there was a KJ Fritzoid, and I thought, what the hell is this guy? Super Destroyer, ECW, he was claiming to be there, which was okay. You know, it, do what you got to do. Nobody knows. I did it for years. My, even my father didn't even know who I was. It was great. But it, it was a good thing, and it worked pretty good. I mean, we did stuff even with Vince. I was under the mask myself and Al Jardine. The spoiler, we were against Wyndham and Rotunda in Madison Square Garden when we first started. Nobody knew. You know, you can wear you could wear a mask and go in. They won't know who you are. It right, for the most part, yeah. It was awesome. It was really good, but that's how that started. With the and we, we were there quite a while until, I guess people, I think the first guy they brought in was Eddie Gilbert. Yep. They started running Eddie Gilbert, and then the Crockets showed up. I remember them showing up, and then this little guy by the name of. Uh, Paul E. came in, and then we knew it was over. It was the end. Promises, promises, and that's the game. That is the game. And we brought a lot of guys in at that time when I was running the dressing room, talking to everybody. We were bringing a lot of talent in, a lot. I mean, even to see when we brought Don Morocco in, that was that was great. I mean, Don was – he was great even with Vince. I mean, the guy was just persona. He was great. But Jimmy's 
Jimmy Snooker too. Super fun. He was oh, he was fantastic. I mean, what a nice guy. You know, he is another person that was just sit in the dressing room, do his thing. Him and his head brother. You know, he was just and we did a lot. We traveled together. We if we could find the tape, him and I had one of the best singles matches as a super destroyer and him. Boy, and I can't remember it down at the ocean by Jersey in Pennsylvania. We hardly we didn't spend it hardly any time in the ring, but we went up the catwalk all the way to the top. And he dove off the railing onto me into the water and pinned me underwater. Oh my god. Um, we, we, if we could just find that tape. Boy, and I can't remember the name of the artiste, the ring announcer would know where that tape is because they were doing a lot of that taping back then. And they that talked about it was a match of the of the month down there in all I think it was Pro Wrestling Illustrated. It was one of those that were diving off the railing onto me into the water. It was unbelievable. Amazing. But again, I wish we knew where all those tapes were. Now they're filtering up. Somebody's with the access of the internet now, people are starting to get them. So I guess when, you can hide. So when they say ECW original, you're actually a real ECW original. You know what I mean? Like they'll throw some guys out there as ECW <coughs> original. They don't aren't really there. technically. Don't no, don't, don't go, go there. there. Don't, okay. don't go there. I, I get pet peeved when I hear that. I do. Because where were there? Where where were they? Now some of them were there when we were there, like the Sandman, the the uh Pitbulls, Gary yep. and Anthony. Yep. I mean uh the guys they don't even mention, Smith, J.T. Smith, J.T. Smith, yep. Uh, the the Suicide Blondes, Johnny Hotbody. Oh Jesus Christ! There's all those guys that were you know, Iron Man, you know, Tommy Cairo, Tommy Cairo, and then Dreamer and all the other guys that came later. This you know, I the. The violence got bad then. When uh, Sal Balomo had his jaw broken, it started to get bad. You know, with the, the nails and the barbed wire, bring your own weapons and that. Yep. It got it got out of hand. And then with certain women losing their tops on TV and the, the sexism, yep. it just, where was the story? I don't know, but we, we had a great thing in the beginning. We did something fresh and new. It was something that, again, it became one of the third biggest of the world that some big shot had to buy it out <coughs> just to squash it. And they did. They really did. So you they don't. Worried. They were going to worry, I guess, that it was going to get too big. Maybe, yeah. You got you to eat it up before it gets too big, yeah. And there was rumors flying all over. I mean, when they started to go to Japan and the money was getting, we heard a lot of rumors, whether it's true. I don't know. I wasn't there. Did they pay all the guys? We heard, you know, certain Bam Bam Bigelow was owed money. This one was owed money. I can't ask Bam Bam now. He's not with us no more. And I had a lot of matches with him over the years. And you think, did they? I don't know. We Like, again, I can't ask him. But – I'm glad at the time we probably left when they when they did the mass versus mass match and I had to disrobe my partner. We knew it was over. It was over. And then they were par pairing me with with uh, Shane Douglas at that time, and Sherry Martell was going to be our manager. The writing was on the wall. It was done. But that's okay. Just, did, just didn't fit there anymore, basically. No, kind of, sort of. When they took our our persona away with the super D's, you know, we went on the independent route then and Bob Bailey, upstate New York, USWF. We did that with him for a period of time. We just were, I think it was last year, the year before we were just inducted into his hall of fame too. So we, we had a lot of good times, a lot of runs and a lot of things. 10 o'clock should cut off anyway, but, uh, yeah. There's a lot of things that we can't touch tonight anyway, like a lot of stuff. The, the, the characters that I portrayed with and without Vince as the Sheik and the Cowboy and all the things down the road, like the other two or three podcasts I did, they went like uh, 
California guy that from over in Australia. He wants to touch base again. And you know what it's like when you interview guys a couple of times. It's hard to hit the same thing over and over again. So we always tease on the things that we didn't. Like you never heard of Fracture Fransburg. You can ask Mario. Yep. Uh, some of the stuff like the mask, the masked assassin, myself and Al Jardine. And that's out there yet somewhere. And uh, I mean, how you get to work with Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda. I mean, wow. You know, these guys were superstars. Even when we did the commercials, which you don't know about out in California, we did, we spent weeks out there doing Toyota trucks. I had a, uh, I did a screen test with Robert Wagner and Raymond Burr out there. Wow. And they were, they were actually, we went on a tour one day in the bus and they were filming with Mr. T and Prepar, uh, Prepar what's his name? Uh, George Papar. Yeah, the eighteen. They were filming, and they were in the first WrestleMania when we were involved in that. And they saw us, and they brought us in off the tram. I mean, it was it was nuts. It was so nuts. And we we're at Venice Beach working out in in the Gold's Gym, and those guys, the Barbarian Twins, and all the big shot pro uh, pro uh, weightlifters, and they're wanting our pictures and, and photographs and all. It was it was crazy. We're nobody. I'm nobody from nowhere. Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. Who the hell's that? Well, they don't now because, you know, greatest athlete of the century. They did the movie here. They did all that crap. And it was, it was, wow. It was a life learning experience. And it was great. I tell everybody again, follow your dreams. The power of the WWF at that point too. I mean, very, very mainstream. It was good because we got, as a corrections officer, and when I wasn't working, they'd be running the TV, and I'd be in the cell block, and the the clients or the prisoners would be looking at TV. And wait a minute, wait a minute, is that him? <laughs> so yeah. a lot of the guards wanted to work on my shift because there wasn't a lot of activity, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean sometimes, but but it was. Uh, that was good. I mean, it, it really was. Uh, I was lucky. I'm not going to lie to you. I was lucky. I was really lucky. Was there ever any heat with Big Boss Man and you over that? Or no, not? actually, I never really got to meet him because at that time when we come back, we were already overseas and lost. He was already established. And then what really was a lot of ire is when they brought this other guy out of nowhere, Nails. The yes. convict, Kelly, I think his name was. Yeah, Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly. And I thought, man, this is really great. And they capitalized on that until they beat up Vince, I guess. But <laughs> that's, they, they, and, you know, you wonder where the ideas come from. And I think of, you know, the, maybe the guys come up with this like I did and have them come and get good ideas and – I don't know. I don't know. But then again, we weren't smart enough back in the day to get attorneys and have copyrights. And maybe, right. maybe, I don't know. I can't say. Although I did get, when when, they, when Hogan did that movie down south, oh my God, No Holds Barred? Yep. I wasn't there, but I got paid. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they contacted me to go down. But at that point, when I got back from uh, I think it was Saudi Arabia, I was called back to my regular job at Bethlehem Steel, which I already had years in, and you know I had to, I had to go back there because I already was vested. And uh, Pat Patterson said to me, "Well, you got to be down there. Here's your plane ticket and everything." I said, "I can't. Sorry, I already I got more invested here." And he sent me a couple of checks. Wow, nice. So I thought, man. That was pretty interesting. No holds barred, but, Zeus. Yeah. Yeah, that was. We met him a few times afterwards because I would still come and, as long as the chief was a, was an agent, we'd still go to the shows here close by, and I'd get in, of course. And uh, even in the early years when we were with, just starting out, and I met Rodney or uh, Yokozuna, Rodney Anoyi when he was just training. 
and I'd go into the, when he was Yokozuna, then we'd go to all the local shows here and, well, we knew him, you know, and Rodney would come over and he'd hug us and how you doing and this and that. And it was, back then it was so different. I don't know. I, I don't even know if I'd want to go into the dressing room today because who the hell would you know now? I don't even know who owns it. You? Because I don't. Uh, as far as the big thing, I guess TKO, the, the big corporation. Uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit too corporate now for sure. And Vin, obviously Vince is gone. So Dana yeah, White? Very, very Dana White? He's a part of TKO, but more on the UFC oh. side. Okay. So yeah, it's really Art know. Emanuel and Mark Shapiro, these guys from TKO. Big Hollywood guys. Oh, boy. And uh, I, I'm trying to figure this out. AEW and up here, are they brothers? Cons? No, no relation. Tony no is relation. AEW. Nick is WWE. He's the CEO, but no uh, relation. Well, they're changing talent back and forth pretty easy. Yeah. Seems like WWE's getting the the um, the better end of it, though, for the most part. Well, time will tell. Nothing lasts forever. Just remember that. Speaking of WB, what about your your cousin? Have you heard from uh, Gene Schnitzky lately and, and your trainee, Gene Schnitzky? No, not really. We haven't spoken in quite a while. Oh, okay. No relationship? Yeah. Uh, none whatsoever. He's, uh, he's my first cousin, but uh, when we were one, I was training him and his partner Robbie Harper. Man, they were big. Whew. They were really big. We were. I was running shows up here. I had a promoter's license for a while, and some of them they were missing for some reason, and they were ended up down in Florida at Dory Funk School. And uh, they would call and said, you know, your, your protégés are down here. And they don't need training because they were highlighting our card. Well, they just kind of disappeared. And next thing I know, they were on. My father called me and said they're on TV with the Samoans. So, kind of lost contact. Oh wow! Okay. And then he's kicking babies on WWF TV, which was an interesting gimmick for a while. It it was it was wow. I mean. From going again out of nowhere, right up there, because he did show up here a while back, a long time ago. Uh, he came here to one day and said, "Hey, I just got signed for OVW," and I gave him some advice. I said, "Whatever they tell you to do, make sure you do it," and that was that was it. And then a couple of weeks later, right up with Kane, right up. Yeah. Yep. Oh, wow! What a lifetime. Wow, I mean that's the opportunity. He he is he did what he did. I don't know how long he must have lasted five, six years, I guess, but we don't really contact, haven't seen or heard from him in quite a while. No. But I guess he's living his dream too. Absolutely, yes. As we hit the wind down, we head towards the finish. Give me some favorite matches or favorite opponents. Because, I mean, you wrestled a, a lot of awesome guys in <laughs> WWF. Piper, of course, you mentioned before included. Um, Steamboat, a bunch of – Bret Hart, a bunch of really good guys. Well, when we did the commercials out in Hollywood for Toyota Trucks, we worked with a lot of guys. And even when we went overseas, we did a lot of guys. Favoritism-wise, Hillbilly Jim. Because we did the when we trained him and kind of sort of trained him when we when we I used to pick him up at the airport up in Connecticut when he first came up as Harley Davidson, right down, down south he was Harley Davidson. He was one of the nicest guys. When we went over to Australia together, we we traveled together. He was one of the favorite guys. When I helped him, even when we did the a lot of the magazines for Vince, how I said they turned on me and that. He was so jovial and jovial and all the good things. He was. He said, well, how about we have a match, Vince, and I'll give you most of the match and then just beat you in the end and stuff like that. So he's one of the guys. Junkyard Dog was another. He was the nicest guy, and he would always do the running power slam. And he would say, AJ, another guy, he'd give me a lot and then beat me in the end. Another, The, the third guy would be... Uh, 
God damn it, he passed away here not too long ago. King Kong Bundy. Bundy was from Asbury Park, right? Technically, Glassboro, New Jersey. Um, Bam Bam was from Asbury. Okay, you're right. Well, Bundy, every time we'd have a TV match down at Ag Hall, my backyard, it was him and I, and he'd get me in the dressing room. He said, listen, your dad's here. I'm going to give you so much. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, when we lock up, I'm going to throw you in a turnbuckle. I'm coming running, and you move and hit that turnbuckle. And the minute you, you, I hit that buckle, I'm going to fall on my ass. You cover me. One, two, and I'm going to throw you off. Next, we do that. Next thing I know, the referee, my dad's in the ring. Oh he my said, God. nobody, nobody does this to my kid. So Pat <laughs> Patterson's pulling my father out of the <laughs> ring. Bundy gets up and grabs a hold of me and throws me and does it again. Well, my dad can't jump in the ring this time. So he pushes me off up in the air, does something and pins me one, two, three. My father didn't speak to me all the way home. And it was a local television station. By the time I got home, was on TV already. Wow, that's awesome. He was, but he says to me in the dressing room, Bundy, he said, I hope your dad had a good night. So those like were like the famous. And our friends right from Allentown, PA, here were the Nasty Boys. And they were with us, too. And they would always tease. They're still available. They're down in, of course, uh, Florida now. Friends with Hogan, of course, their whole lives. And yep. we're still good friends on Facebook. We always tease them. Those were good guys to work with also. And they would always ask me when they trained with Brad Reagans out in Minnesota or whatever, they'd say, how do you get with Vince? How do you get in with them? And it's so hard to explain. How the hell do I know? I, I had a referee that got me. But most of them guys, I don't – some of them, we really didn't do a whole lot of travel. Nikolai Volkov, him and I traveled. He was good to work with because he gave you a lot. And he was, if you see some of his early tapes, he had hair. And he yeah. was a referee in the beginning in the early days. Even the Sheik that just passed away, he would give us a lot. It was good to work with him because they understood. And the last guy I'm going to tell you was George the Animal Steel. When we were out in Hollywood doing the commercials, we would go to the shows and get on the bus. And Steel would look back and say, Are these the new guys? And he'd say to us, point blank, if you guys can last five years. Now, listen, he goes, if you can last five years, you'll be all right. They'll take care of you. Little did he know that Mark Sadacek, his nephew, would drag me in a year from then or half a year and do this Fracture Franzberg gimmick. So that's it, my friend. Crazy. What a career. What a life. Awesome stuff. I love it because WWF, the Hogan era, the, the golden era, if you will, and then ECW at the beginning. So very, very interesting career. It was a great time. I don't know what to tell the new people today, except if you can find a real school that's going to teach you. And I'll give one last two minutes. Well, we can run over it. When we trained at the school up in Connecticut, Tony Altimore, first thing we ever learned was how to bump. Okay, we grab the bottom rope and fall back, tuck in your head so you don't get headaches and hurt your neck. After we managed that, we went to the next rope, did the same thing. And then the third rope and did the same thing. Now, all of a sudden, he laid us on the mat, took a 25 uh, cement bag, and dropped it on our chest. Oh. And then went up to the second rope and in the turnbuckle and dropped it on our chest. And then went up to the third turnbuckle and dropped it on our chest. And wonder, what the hell is he doing? Well, then the cement bag went up to 40 pounds and did the same thing. Well, that's a hell of a drop after that third run. And uh, finally, one of them, one of our, whoever it was, asked him, well, why are we doing this? Well, there's a reason for everything, he said. And this is why. To catch Snooker when he goes off the top rope on the <laughs> chest. And yeah. that's the truth. Because I caught Snooker a lot of times. And, brother, when he comes off, he came off. And wow, look at nice. him. He saw all his films when you saw that. And that's no lie. So 
even at this stage of my life in my early 70s, I would love to get in the ring. And I'm still, you can ask my partner, Dougie and, and Ron Shaw, Sundays, which was yesterday, I still shrug 725 pounds. Now I can only do it once or twice. Wow. But at this stage, because we still go to the gym three days a week, when the weather's nice, if I'm not down on the, on the treadmill, I ride bicycle out the lake three miles out, three miles back all the time. I'm not, I don't want to brag, but at this stage of my life, half the people my age are dead. Most of the people in my yep. graduating class of 1969 are not here. So again, here we are. Have your lifestyle the way it should. So some of us are old and we might be diabetic. We might have some problems with our health, but you can't give up. The minute you give up, who knows what's going to happen. So that I give a little bit of education, we only touched a little bit. Yes. We can give you everything. And don't go looking at Wikipedia. <laughs> yes, true. All right. Did I answer AJ. some of your, some of your All, questions? Yeah. Yep, definitely, for sure. So if you have anything else that you're finding on the Internet, which I probably know you will, down the road, if you want to have a continuance, you can. Okay. Some of the stuff we didn't touch my counseling and how I used to go around to schools and colleges giving seminars. And that's just something we could touch on because, boy, you should see some of my speeches. Oh, <laughs> no, nice. you better okay. not. <laughs> but uh, no, we, we really give an audience while standing in front of Madison Square Garden and with a microphone, we get we keep your interest. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, good. Thank, yeah. Thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Well, I thank you for this. I don't like to do too many interviews, but we're starting to get the, the hang of it. Nice. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right.